there is more to Professor Swamidas's book, The Genealogical Adam and Eve, The Surprising Science of Universal History, or sorry, Universal Ancestry, than meets the biological eye. We can easily fix our attention on the debate about harmonizing Genesis and genetics. While this is certainly a very important topic, we must also account for the fact that a moral vision of human perfection frames the discussion. Swamidas bookends the volume with two sets of three quote unquote aspirations or virtues, courage, curiosity, and empathy in chapter one, and tolerance, humility, and patience in chapter 18. I have been asked to respond to these two chapters. Swamidas acknowledges his debt to John Inazu, his colleague at Washington University, for the second set of aspirations or virtues, and hopefully I pronounce his name correctly, which Inazu uh, develops with legal authority in mind, whereas Swamidas has, quote unquote, scientific authority in mind. These aspirations build upon Swamidas' goal as a scientist in the church and a Christian in science, a goal which he shares with his colleague from whom he quotes. To make room for our differences, even as we maintain our own beliefs and practices. The second set of aspirations taken from his colleague ground Swamidas's ongoing civic practice, which gives rise to this book. The three virtue sets, fourth in chapter one, aid scientific inquiry. The three virtue sets are set for found in chapter 18, uh, assist in engaging our pluralistic society. Let's take up each set of aspirations or virtues in turn. As Swamidas acknowledges, it takes courage to ask questions that are filled with uncertainty. As with how much does evolutionary science press on our understanding of Adam and Eve? In Swamidas's case, the uncertainty and with it fear that he experienced for years in engaging in this question eventually gave rise to curiosity. His particular curiosity stemmed from a growing confident faith that was rooted, his wording, in the second Adam, Jesus, rather than in the first Adam. Such curiosity led Swamidas to a new or deeper, lo deeper level of understanding and discovery of a curious fact, namely that everyone was convinced that evolutionary science unsettled our understanding of Adam and Eve. But I couldn't find the evidence that demonstrated this is true, he says. As a result, where others could only see confrontations, collisions, fractures, and dead ends between evolutionary science and the biblical account of Adam and Eve, he could see a crossroads and a new path forward involving empathic understanding for people of faith without in any way denying scientific analysis and authority. There is something here for all of us to take away from Swamidas's reflections on his own journey. Courage leads to curiosity and empathy. The only point I would add as a theologian is that the starting point in scripture, as I read it, is the divine empathy, which inspires courage and curiosity bound up with increasing confidence in Christ Jesus, which in turn gives rise to empathy for one another. Thomas notes in chapter 18 that scientists wield immense authority about human origins. It is important that they wield such authority as a scalpel rather than a blunt sword. In other words, they must yield their authority virtuously like religious authority, scientific authority can easily be abused. What is required are the virtues of tolerance, humility, and patience, which are set forth in chapter 18. Swamidas recounts a story from chapter one where a discussion on human origins and Adam and Eve involving an evolutionary scientist and a pastor holding to a traditional reading of the Genesis account led to a dead end. The conversation could have moved toward a crossroads rather than a roadblock involving a collision and fracture if these virtues had shaped the conversation. Rather than imposing their will on the other party, a scientist should model humility, he thinks, he argues, realizing that they might not be able to change their dialogue partner's mind. Tolerance on the part of the scientist would make space for the other perspective while living in the tension of disagreement. Patience is also required as would allow the person adhering to a traditional reading of the Genesis text to articulate how it might be reconciled with an evolutionary account of human origins. Someone adhering to a traditional account of scripture, like the pastor in question, must also model humility, tolerance, and patience, 
this person must approach the subject matter free of rigidity, which would impose or force agreement in every domain. In my estimation, it is doubtful that Swaminas would have settled on the latter three aspirations or virtues if he had not experienced an evolution in his own person from creativity to curiosity to empathy, noted in chapter one. Though it is not set forth in his own autobiographical account, I maintain that empathy in some form gives rise to courage and curiosity, and in turn, more empathy, a point made earlier in this review. One of the most important features of any well-functioning community or society is empathy for those not belonging to one's own in-group, whether familial, scientific, religious, or other. Empathy has been an increasingly short supply for the past several years, as the social psychologist Jonathan Haidt observes. From a Christian perspective, the greatest of all spiritual gifts is love, which involves empathic concern for the well-being of the other at its core. Here it is worth noting that in his seminal account of virtue, the nature of true virtue, Jonathan Edwards grounded virtuous love in the inter-Trinitarian mutual love between the several persons of the Godhead, which extends outward toward the creation. For Edwards, love for being in general is the fount of virtue. Being in general is the triune God and by extension, all being. Since love for being in general, the triune God is the fount of virtue, then God's love must first be for God's triune self and then extend outward, flowing out to particular beings. Private or particular affection does not convey true virtue, which is just noted, involves a general benevolence toward all and which flows from being in general, which is the triune God. Such unconditional love was on display in Martin Luther King Jr.'s work, which Swamidas reads with others in the wake of Ferguson and police protests near his home in St. Louis as he was completing this book. Such love no doubt inspires Swamidas's larger social vision, healing fractures, rebinding a broken cosmos, inclusion overtaking exclusion, shalom giving rise to what he refers to as quote unquote, peaceful science. Swamidas's account of virtue shows that there is more than meets the biological eye regarding this book. There is still more though. You have heard it said that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Regardless of whether that is the case, Swamidas' project involves the pursuit of what he finds most beautiful. It propels him forward to look for connections where so many only see collisions and fractures at the crossroads of faith and science. Swamidas' sense of the beautiful is not a matter of private sentiment and taste, rather it entails the public pursuit of a more glorious harmony that brings together seemingly disconnected parts into what he refers to as the many colored wisdom of God. He goes on to claim, and I quote, in the wasteland of origins, virtue can arise. If we make space for one another with tolerance, humility, and patience, I wonder if new sorts of beauty might arise. Some are convinced evolution is a myth. Others are convinced that Adam and Eve are a myth. One person's fact might be another's fiction but they can enter, both can enter the same narrative at a crossroads of many questions. Meaning grounds like this are rare and they have value, unquote. Swamidas does not seek to dismiss or undermine the scientific consensus of origins. Rather, he embraces the scientific rules pertaining to origins while also seeking to develop ground rules for a more constructive engagement of domains beyond scientific inquiry. One of the takeaways for me from his treatment is that the narrative that creationists and evolutionists, evolutionists potentially share in terms of our common history is big enough for large questions concerning such matters as inheritance, dominion, and genetic manipulation. Such large questions require all of us to seek answers if we are to move toward constructive and comprehensive solutions benefiting all parties. In reading Swaminathan's account, on the import of the virtues and beauty, I am reminded of two historical treatments involving scientific inquiry. Let's begin with the virtues. Here I call to mind Peter Harrison's discussion of faith and science in the territories of science and religion. Harrison argues that in the ancient and medieval world, religion or theology and natural philosophy, which today is reduced to science, were not separate disciplines, but rather two aspects of a larger enterprise. 
They were stages guiding us toward our telos as humans. Virtue is a way of life. All this changed with the privatization of religion in the post-religious wars setting of Europe, where the emerging nation states interiorized religion for political purposes. Confessions of this period were set forth as discrete, objective propositional statements used to unite and distinguish religious traditions for territorial cohesion, serving the various nations of Europe. Later, science moved in the same propositionalist direction where the aim was to arrive at objective propositions and activities, not virtue. The reduction of religion to a series of formulaic propositions and activities was exported, was exported to the rest of the world where like the Christian faith, other spiritual traditions were internalized and privatized as religions, emphasizing doctrine and practices for the sake of European colonial ambitions. These religions were often placed, replaced, or sorry, placed by Christianity's apologists in competition with Christianity, rather than its distinct paths leading to virtue with the Christian faith as the apex. Such competition also arose between religion and science as a result of such territorial disciplinary and political moves. Do I have about four more minutes? You're very near the end. How about okay. two more minutes? Okay. Um, if opportunity were uh, present, I would go into uh, Owen Gingrich's account of Copernicus and Ptolemy, where he says that it was beauty, not mathematical facts that first drove his inquiry to replace what he took to be an ugly monster with Ptolemy's universe. It was beauty uh, that ultimately framed Copernicus's inquiry. Moving on, whether one believes in Jesus as God to the extent Swamidas's account of the virtues is embodied in the Nazarene, we can trace the contours of his life in our pursuit of a more noble humanity. This book is not simply about origins, but about originating discourse and how to be virtuous in our engagement with one another in pursuit of human flourishing and perfection. His treatment of virtues in the first and final chapters are not placeholders, but rather frame the entire book. This in and of itself is worth the price of admission for purchasing the volume. Far from falling prey to a Kantian divide between the natural and human, in fact and freedom, which only Kant's subjective account of beauty tenuously unites, Swamidas's moral quest, along with aesthetics, shapes the pursuit of human harmony between genesis and genetics that accounts for the biblical narrative as well as evolution. It would be worth exploring what Swamidas might discover in the future work he were to pursue a synthesis, if you're to pursue a synthesis or a harmony of morality with nature involving an explicitly personalist account of human being. My concluding paragraph. In a world where political doctrine and civic discourse often emphasizes what is useful rather than what is good and where efficiency often eclipses purpose, Swamidas's confidence in Jesus, who according to the Orthodox theologian Irenaeus of Lyons, recapitulates and transforms our humanity leads us forward in the quest for a moral teleology for human flourishing. This moral teleology involves our emergence as a species along the lines of evolutionary biology without being reduced to it, nor to the infancy state of humanity as Irenaeus viewed Adam and Eve. Rather, it leads us to treat one another virtuously in the midst of all of our keen differences, not as things, but as persons, as Dr. King envisioned in view of Jesus in his own pursuit of the beloved community. 